do this every day, so it's there we enough. go. Okay, this is the May meeting of the WebRTC Working Group. A little bit about the IPR policy. Group abides by it, and only people and companies listed on this page are able to make substantive contributions. So today we've got a lot of things. We may not get through all of them, but uh, WebRTC extensions, WebRTC PC, Capture Controller, Go to Transform, the Capture Extensions and Dynamic Sources. Um, we have a proposal to move the June 28th meeting to June 7th. The next meeting after that is July 19th and uh, potentially cancel the August meeting because usually people are on vacation in August. Uh, how do people feel about June 7th? Is that something we could do? Move it then. Do we want to take a poll or something like that? Uh, yeah, why don't we try that? Just, uh, can, you know, attend yes or no. Can you, can you make it? Let's say that. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, okay, I launched it as an actual poll just to make it uh, easier. Okay. okay. Or, although it looks like everybody is yes except for single no, so yeah, but fine. Um, should we conclude this? It looks like it's uh, four yes, one no, and one I cannot make either way, so. Oh, okay. Uh, so, yeah, I'll say. Uh, All right. So. Move the details. Okay. All right, a little bit about this meeting. Uh, the slides, link to the slide is up on the wiki. We do need a volunteer for note taking. Do we have anybody to take notes? Since we're on already 15 minutes late, I'll take this up. Well then. Okay. Um, all right. So we do have a code of conduct in W3C. Uh, so let's keep it professional and cordial. Um, you know, do uh, for the uh, speaking, uh, use plus Q and minus Q in the Google Meet chat to get into and out of the speaker queue so we can manage that. Uh, speakers can manage their own queues when doing your slides. Uh, I won't go over this understanding document stuff. Okay, so um, I think what I'll do, uh, Dom, to give more time, I'll kind of only, uh, probably only deal with like one or two issues from the WebRTC extension stuff, and then we can move to Capture Controller to kind of get ourselves back on track. Okay, so uh, this is the list of stuff that I have on the list. We probably won't get to much more than two of them. Uh, but let's start with RTP header extension encryption. So uh, I don't know, is Sergio here, finally? Uh, well, so not yet. Uh, not yet. Okay, so Cryptex is in, it's completed ITFLS call now. Um, there's, Sergio is, I think, working on finishing up the last changes in response to the ITFLS call comments. Um, so we're getting uh, towards the point where uh, it's, it's almost done. And we had an API proposal at the September 15, 2020 meeting. Um, and the basic idea here is to encrypt the RTP headers on all the M sections or none, or well, it's not within a bundle or, or uh, none of them. Um, so the way it works is you always attempt to negotiate cryptex. So you put a equal cryptex on all the M lines in a browser that supports cryptex. Um, and then uh, you can set the policy whether you want to negotiate, which means you'll accept it not being supported by the other side, or require, which is that the other side has to support it or you'll fail. 
Um, and then on each transceiver, you get a little attribute that tells you whether it was negotiated or not. So that's basically uh, what, we, uh, what we had in the API. Um, we had one question, which was about um, the, uh, what, you know, the various uh, cases where the other side doesn't support Cryptex. So what can happen is you, a browser can send an offer to a peer that doesn't support it, or of course you can get an offer from a peer that doesn't support it. Um, and uh, it basically, it, Cryptex is, the extension is what's called bundle transport. Um, and, and it only requires that you have A equal Cryptex in all the M lines of a bundle group. But you can have multiple bundle groups uh, you might not be bundling, so it doesn't require that all M lines be identical. So here's an example that Harold uh, came up with, um, where you have basically one bundle is for audio and the other is for video, um, so everything's not on the same port. Um, and this is this would be an offer you got from uh, it would be from a non-browser. Um, and so here, what's happening is for some reason uh, the Audio is doing cryptex, but the video is not. Uh, maybe there's a different, it's a, like a legacy video system that doesn't support cryptex. So if you put in require as your RTP header encryption policy, the browser would reject this offer. Uh, but if you put in negotiate, basically what will happen is the browser would send cryptex for audio, but not for video. So it's, you can get these situations where it's sending it on some bundles, but not others. Um, but uh, I think that's basically what will happen if it's negotiate, and probably negotiate has to be the, the default. So we have a, a PR now uh, for this, uh, which is PR 106. And um, I'd encourage people to review it. Uh, basically, uh, it's, here we have the uh, header encryption policy of negotiator require. Uh, trying to explain what that means exactly. Um, I don't know if we need more examples with respect to this, how this works, uh, uh, but um, this is what's in the PR. Uh, it is a little complicated because uh, you do have to change some of the, the steps in, in Weber to CPC. Um, to, to set the policies and stuff like that. Um, and then we have this, this extension, uh, this attribute of the transceiver, which is the RTP header encryption negotiated um, attribute. So uh, what do people think about this? Any, any comments? Any reason it's not a get parameter? A uh, read on the get parameter? Uh, it sh uh, well, uh, which, which one? The en encryption policy? Uh, previous slide. Oh, previous slide. Uh, yeah, this would be a. Oh, that's per transceiver. Sorry. Yeah, it's read only. It should be read only, and it is. Good. And uh, it's per transceiver? Yes. Um, yeah, it really only needs to be per bundle, but you can't, can't really, there's no way to really do that. So it's, we put it on the trace. Um, overall, this, this looks good to me. Uh, I'm just wondering whether we could, whether we want to simplify it and say whether bundle or not, we, we're just supporting cryptex or not. Uh, I don't know if it simplifies implementations, but it, it's simplifying a little bit, like uh, the, the checks uh, that, that that we would do. It will it will be only in one place that you would check whether um, cryptex is negotiated or not, and not for each transceiver. Yeah, I mean, it would be because of this weird situation here, right? You would. Uh, the question is, how would you tell somebody that it was not on any of the video M lines, but it was on the audio M lines. Um, the problem is we have no concept of bundle in WebRTC CPC, so there's no there's no attribute of this bundle. It's just for each 
each of these uh, mids. Um, I mean, I guess it could be a property on the transport because that's what a bundle is. Right, right, right. But, it could be yeah, than that. But uh, you know, it's what could go that way, could go the other. Yeah. What I'd like to encourage people to do is to review it um, and uh, take a look at PR 106 and put in your comments. You can try to iron out any last uh, things in, in this. The question, since this is a uh, configuration, what happens if you change it with set configuration from negotiate to require, for example, and you already have transceivers? Uh, yeah, that strikes is, me as a really bad idea. Yeah, it is a bad idea. Uh, but the question is, uh, um, do we prevent that from happening? Yeah, I think I think that that's reasonable to do. Um, yeah, changing changing that is really awful, and uh, you know. Writing tests for it is going to be another matter entirely. Yeah. So let's just keep it simple, unless we see a use case, I guess. I don't see a use case off the top of my head. There's no reason you should do that. Yeah, that would be that would be horrible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we've, we've got as much as we can out of that one. So uh, I do want to try to cover this 2735. Uh, so it's been changing a little bit. Uh, when he, This is what it looked like when the issue was originally filed, which is uh, basically what, what this is about is, is some confusion, I think, that may exist about RFC 7728. Um, and the filer basically said, he was confused about what level of support is required for RFC 17. This is the RTP stream pause. Uh, and the problem is, it's there's no level of support required. <laughs> um, RFC 7, so, yeah. I, I can speak to this very briefly. Okay, um, right. uh, there is one place in Weber TCPC uh, where it specifies paying attention to the simulcast RID paused uh, flag, so the little tilde that you put in uh, the SDP in the simulcast attribute. So we've got one place in set remote description uh, for processing remote answers that specifies looking at that paused flag from 88.53 and then setting the active bit on the, uh, the encoding parameters to reflect uh, that state. But uh, if you're going to support that flag, that little tilde, that requires support for 7728. And so my question was, OK, if we're going to be paying attention to that, don't we need to support 7728? And it seems like, uh, like people are kind of leaning towards removing that language from Weber TCPC. So just ignore that, uh, that little rid pause flag and that just makes the problem go away yeah i mean my uh my question overall is why the tilde is even in there because um basically it's it seems like it's a problem because in set parameters right you can set active or not it's it's not supposed to cause any sdp renegotiation or any activity at all in sdp um and there is something called a video layer allocation header extension, which essentially, you know, sent along with the RTP packets that tells you if a simulcast layer is stopped because the bandwidth, effective bandwidth is zero. So uh, I'm not sure why the tilde is even in SDP, what, what the point of that is. Uh, Florent, or do, do, you under, do you know why this is there? What the point of this is? I think that it might have been an issue in the implementation. Okay, uh, where so the implementer um, mixed uh, two different features. Yeah. Um, so I think we need to. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't. 
I, I, I think this probably shouldn't be there is the answer. Um, I think we'll pro probably need to uh, think it over to uh, decide what changes need to be made to the spec. Uh, but based on this, I think uh, we can mark 2735 as ready for PR uh, and try to come up with a, a pull request to, to figure out what to do. with. OK. So uh, why don't, since we're a little bit behind, why don't we move, skip over these uh, issues, because uh, they're a bit complicated, and move to uh, capture controller. Any bar? Yes, thank you. And uh, sorry for my voice. I'm a little under the weather today, so yes. I go a little slowly. Um, all right, uh, so this is, yeah, next slide, please. So I'm going to uh, propose uh, a new API um, that would cover uh, two issues, or maybe three. Um, and the first one of those is conditional focus. <clears throat> so just a recap, uh, Get Display Media is a tool that enables the acquisition of a user's display. And that's from the spec, and that's really all it does. But all browsers today, at least the ones that um, allow capture of window uh, and or tab, uh, will focus a window or tab upon capture, which assumes that the use case is traditional screen sharing in a video conference. And uh, this is turning out to be too limiting for some apps. Um, in recent developments, we have capture handle identity and actions that exist to let apps keep the user in the VC tab. And also, we're, we're hearing from some screen recording apps that it's too soon to focus the new screen because the user hasn't hit record yet. And they're asking for a way to focus later, uh, which is not part of the proposal at the moment. Um, but this is uh, about providing a place where we can put potential controls and have these discussions later. So where to put a focus control API? Why not the video track? Well, there are two reasons. Uh, media stream track is a media consumption abstraction that is both clonable and constrainable. What that means is that you can have one source and many consumers where each track has its basically its own constraints. And the constraints mechanism here lets basically arbitrate, excuse me, will arbitrate between uh, for some properties on a source that are not shareable. You can use constraints to negotiate. But in practice, most browsers implement uh, things like downscaling and frame estimation per track. So that means that these tracks can have independent settings. Uh, and that's fine for some APIs. Like we have new methods on the track, like crop two, that is basically per clone. So if you crop one tr a track clone, it doesn't affect another. However, imagine a new track focus method, say, uh, would affect all clones. And that's a leaky abstraction because the user's focus is not an inherent property of a single video track, but of the source. And the other problem with putting it on the video track is that. Well, why only the video track? Uh, what about the audio track? Do they both have this property? Uh, if so, why? Uh, why not? And it's confusing. So the problem here is that we've stepped out of media consumption to remote control. And we need I think we need a higher level object to do that, to put that these controls on. Next slide. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so there's a similar issue with um, uh, capture handle actions. Um, there's a method to send the capture action uh, to these. Uh, it's an API to send supported actions to the captured page that we're, we're still uh, discussing. It's still early times for it, but it also seems misplaced on the media stream track where it is right now. And the reasons are the same. Um, basically, one source, many consumers, and unlike crop two, send capture action would affect all clones. Again, a leaky abstraction because progression of the captured page isn't the property of a single video track. And same thing uh, will disappear both on the audio and video track. Who knows? So we've stepped out of media consumption to remote control here. A higher level control object seems needed that is owned by the caller of Get Display Media, isn't clonable, uh, or necessarily shared with every media consumer. Next slide. And similarly, uh, the same argument can be applied to Get Capture Handle. Uh, the spec already notes that there's no consensus yet on whether get capture handle belongs to on media stream track or on a dedicated controller object. 
that is neither clonable nor transferable. However, Chrome has already shipped this, so this proposal focuses primarily on conditional focus and actions at the moment, even though identity isn't mentioned in the slides that I have uh, coming up. Next slide. So this is the idea. Um, this uses a, a pattern that's familiar from uh, those who have used a board controller with fetch. Uh, you first create a new capture controller object, and then you pass it in as an argument to get display media. Uh, what this does, it does a couple of things. It, <clears throat> upon success, this controller is associated one-on-one -on -one with this get display media call. And this is a new advantage because unlike, uh, say, media devices, if you get an event on media devices, you don't know which, uh, you know, which specific capture. You can have multiple captures going on at the same time, and you don't know which you don't know which one it is. But here you have a dedicated object to this particular capture. <clears throat> so you could do things like, if you, if we wanted to later, or we could put this could solve identity where you could put origin and handle directly on this controller object. Uh, you could have a focus method on the controller that returns a promise. So the idea here is that if you don't specify a controller, you get backwards compatible behavior that the browser will automatically focus a window or a tab. But if you specify a controller, uh, it will not automatically focus unless the application calls focus. And this could be the, the application could call this even before calling get display media, or it could call it uh, shortly after. And in the past, we've had really a hard time de uh, defining for how long after. <coughs> there are some security issues there, potentially. But we also have apps that have asked for this. So maybe this will open the door to discuss potential future changes there. Uh, but I don't see a problem, for example, uh, uh, of waiting, allowing up to one second after the, after the call seems fine, as long as the end user can associate the focus with their action. And that seems similar to um, transient activation, for example. The problem we used to have was correlating uh, this focus method with a single get display media success. And we were talking about uh, within a certain, within the next task and really sort of tight knit uh, control there. I don't believe, and this, this kind of solves that because we have a dedicated controller object for this capture only. And same for actions, we could also put get supported actions on this controller. And if, if they are supported, uh, you would get a non-empty array, otherwise you'd get an empty array, and you can send an action on your, um, using your controller uh, dot send action. Next slide, for example. And that's it. We have uh, Elad in the queue. <clears throat> yes, hello. Uh, so I would need to think about this a bit more, but generally the controller uh, pattern seems nice to me. Uh, if this helps us move forward with all sorts of uh, proposals, all the better. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, would you be open to exposing a getter for the controller on a track, or would you consider that this actually goes against the grain of your proposal? And that's number one. And number two, what about a proposed new API right now that returns several streams? Would you also want to return several controllers, or or uh, would you say like, okay, it returns several streams, but each one has a getter for a controller? Um, sure. So on the, on the first question, I think uh, the purpose here would be to not it would be a feature to not expose it on the track. So I, I would discourage having a, a method to get to it because the goal here was to return an object that the owner, the caller of Get Display Media, can keep to themselves and and not necessarily distribute to every downstream media consumer that they may have uh, for clones and that kind of stuff. And because again, if you have a, a single track, that might be one clone of many. And um, it's not clear to me that if, if a JavaScript application wanted this, they could easily add this controller as a custom attribute to their track, right? Uh, that's one thing they could do. But what uh, another thing that you could do is you could say that um, when you clone or when you transfer, you don't actually transfer uh, the controller and that you do separately. But yeah, I guess that uh, you do make a good point that if somebody really wants to attach it to the track, they could do the, it themselves. So. Um, yeah, good point. Okay, great. Uh, and the second question, uh, yeah, I haven't really put anything about multi 
capture here, and uh, I, I'm open to discuss that if, if we think that that's useful. Um, I guess I haven't thought through how, you know, it seems like uh, intuitively I would have expected one controller per per capture, but if you could think of use cases for having a shared one, we could also entertain that, I guess. Um, I would say that if you're capturing several things at once uh, with an API that is not currently standardized but has been proposed, then you might actually have completely different actions for the different uh, things. Uh, and I was kind of leading towards a model in which you different, depending on what you capture, if it's a window, if it's a tab, if it's a screen, you might have different a different um, subclass of media stream track and different things exposed. It looks like a controller would have a bit more trouble doing that unless you also subclass the controller and gave it different properties. Because imagine like focus, for example, makes sense for capturing a window or a tab, but probably not for capturing a screen. But I imagine you would still want to expose focus regardless. So, and then what? It would raise an exception? Yeah, so, so I put a little um, disclaimer at the bottom here. So what did I say here? Sort of my speaker notes down there. Um, um, so yeah, it, the idea of focus would be that it would return for a captured window or tab. It would resolve when the tab or window got focus, but no earlier than get media get display media success. But for a monitor, it would just basically resolve immediately upon get display media success. I didn't see. I mean, make it a no op basically. We could also reject if if you prefer. Um, so what I would have liked in, with subclassing is that you know the application would just be able to check like, hey, do I have a focus method? And screens would simply not have that. Right. Well, also I mean, audio, we could, also audio um, tracks. <clears throat> but that's regardless of your controller. Right. So yeah, so mostly about you know the difference between something that is focusable and something that is not. Right. So the goal is to get. Um, an owner object for your capture. And given that there can be different kinds of capture, I um, mean, we could all, always discuss making different subclasses of capture controller. I think that's a bit uh, excessive at this point, but you know, I think we can always um, discuss that. Hey, Yuan, you're next. Um, so I. Uh, I think that the the idea to separate uh, uh, functionalities that are specific to a source and not to a track uh, is a good idea. So we, we should do that. We we tried to add that to track, and it's uh, it's not a great model. Um, so have it elsewhere where there's a single object uh, is is a good idea. Um, I I'm not less sure about the uh, API surface, but we can probably uh, iterate on it. Um, for instance, um, focus is one thing. Supported actions is another set of things. And maybe it's not just one object, but it might be two objects. Uh, for instance, you might want to have uh, a transferable action controller, because you might want the track to be transferred to uh, a worker, and then you might want to control actions in the same place, for instance. But uh, transferring focus handling does not make sense. So I think we should uh, we should dig into that, uh, apply this idea of separating uh, these functionalities out of track and see where uh, it should be put in the same object, in a different object, in a controller kind of style or in an object that is created by get display media itself and so on. Um, and yeah, let's continue uh, discussing it and improving it. So um, I would have a quick question. Um, how quickly do we think, if we all agree, assuming that we all agree that we want to go this way, how quickly can we actually agree that this is the shape and you know get it done? Because otherwise, it could be that now other discussions that have started a very long time ago, for example, conditional focus, would now get you know scheduled behind yet more discussions. Um, right. Yes. Yeah, so so I, I would say that um, I'm not a huge fan of subclassing and that it has some benefits, I understand, for, you know, a method that's not there. But that's 
usually just going to throw in a different place. You're going to get a you know, type error instead of can't focus error, whatever. So it doesn't seem that different to me. Um, I think the, the main benefit here is to have an object where we don't have one today. Um, and I would certainly welcome getting this ready for, um, I understand um, conditional focus is uh, probably the, the most immediately useful. Uh, so I think we hopefully can go this direction for that. So we don't end up uh, with um, the comp so through, through, through your end. We we could have a we could have um you could already detect what type of capture you've received, right? In theory, in but, practice, only Chrome actually implements that. Yes, but uh, also no one implements this yet. So <laughs> we could definitely implement. Uh, uh, both of those. I mean, it seems like if you have a capture control object, it'd be very useful to know what one useful property would be. What what type of source do I have? And I don't see yeah. a, a problem. But we do have that, that already. Uh, a quick question: uh, yeah. Why do you mean? Th what do you mean that focus would throw elsewhere if it doesn't? Ex like if we subclass? I mean, I would expect that a developer would check, uh, if not not focus, right before calling focus, if they know that this doesn't necessarily have focus. The uh, focus method. Sure, but the the benefits of subclassing that you get from C++, for example, where things don't compile, you catch it earlier, are not present in JavaScript. So you'll you'll get JavaScript developers that just call focus because it worked when they tried it, and uh, something returns a different type suddenly, user picks a different type, and then focus is now not a function of undefined. It's the error they would get, right? So I'm saying subclassing doesn't bias that much in JavaScript. Yeah, I would also try to avoid subclassing and use composability. Like we, we can use different objects or different subobjects of a main object or things like that to group things properly. So to 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 Elad's point, I'm assuming that conditional focus is the one topic where we have the greatest clarity. Maybe capture controller should focus on, so to speak, uh, should focus on on this uh, and. When the time comes to look at supported actions, we can look whether they share enough of the same properties across the two needs. That way, we don't have to solve all the issues. We can make, way, this work, make this pattern work for focus and then uh, adjust or create new classes as needed. That works for me. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, if there is time for one more quick question. OK, nobody objects. Uh, what, what do we think this means for backwards compatibility? I mean, for if capture controller does not exist on the platform, so uh, controller equals new capture controller is probably going to throw, whereas, you know, the, yes. So that looks less than the best solution. Hopefully, there is a better solution. So I for example, all of that. Like feature detection, basically. Um, people yeah, do you feature test detect whether... display media, they would feature detect capture controller, and it's easier to feature detect uh, an interface than feature detect uh, whether a field in a dictionary will have an effect or is supported. Yeah, for better or for worse, that's how um, most APIs are being deployed. Uh, doesn't make for very good looking code, but, but it allows for this kind of evolution. Too. So yeah, uh, I agree. So to me, it's not one hundred percent clear if this is better than putting things on tracks. But if this helps us move forward faster and with more consensus, then I would consider that a huge plus. That's my uh, statement. Um, so concretely, okay. if we do focus on focus, uh, I guess this makes it a screen share repo proposal rather than a capture handle where it's right now being discussed. I'm trying to make sure we have a clear place for iterating on the proposal. I don't know that we have a clear place, but we could certainly put it in screen capture. Um, yeah, that makes sense to me if as we well. We anticipate. Okay.
No other questions? So, Yanivar, you, you raised what an issue, a pull request, what uh, the next step? I, I can do that, yeah. Which one? I'm sorry? Which one, an issue or a pull request? I can provide either or both. Okay. I, I would I would say issue is, is good so that we can uh, talk a little bit about the, the API surface first in the issue and, and then in a pull request. Sounds good. I'll do that. Thanks. Uh, Bernard, I think we can move on. And I have to. All right, but still, uh, hold on. Uh, there we go. All right. Okay. So, what about the encoded transform? You went? Yeah. So, for about we were there a couple of uh, meetings ago, uh, we agreed to add generate keyframe uh, to RTC, RTP script transformer so that uh, when you're adding uh, a transform, a WebRTC encoded transform, you are able to control the encoder and ask the encoder to generate a keyframe. Uh, and currently, that, that's working great. Uh, you can even pass uh, some parameters to say, in case of simulcast, I, I want keyframes for that and that encoder. And uh, th that's working fine. Uh, it's an async uh, method, so it's returning a promise. And the promise is resolving at the time uh, the first keyframe is uh, enqueued in the stream. So when the promise is resolved, you know that you will uh, be able to read and get to uh, the keyframe very, very quickly. Uh, it was mentioned uh, during uh, the generation of the PR and uh, discussions that uh, if the promise could return the timestamp, the keyframe timestamp, it would be a nice addition. And uh, that's true. It, it would make life a little bit easier, probably. Um, but since generate keyframe is able currently to um, generate several keyframes uh, from different encoders, uh, we would need to uh, generate multiple timestamps and potentially resolve at the last uh, timestamp. So it, it, it does not work great with multiple reads. So next slide. The, the idea is to basically uh, um, remove, uh, to, to change the parameter from a, a sequence, just one parameter. So the old version is um, returning a promise with no value, and it has a sequence. And the new version would be uh, returning a promise that would resolve to timestamp. And uh, there will be an optional read, meaning that you can um, select which encod encoder you, you want. Uh, the old API can be shimmed with the new version. Uh, using promise race, so that's that's probably fine. Um, and if no read is provided, um, because it's an optional parameter, then uh, the first encoder would be uh, selected. So that's the proposal, and there's a corresponding PR 132 about that. Um, thoughts? I think it's okay. Cool. So if there's a agreement, we can go to the next topic and mark, and then editors will be able to uh, finalize UPR. Okay. Um, now going to media capture extensions. So we discussed. Um, in the past, background blur, and uh, we know that background blur is being deployed in web pages uh, a lot these days. Uh, a lot of websites are actually using uh, Canvas, WebGL, Wasm, whatever, uh, web technology to implement background blur, and it's working. Uh, it's also being supported by OSs, uh, like iOS and macOS, for instance, have background blur built in support. And uh, Riju and Eero uh, did some measurements, I believe, and they, they can talk about uh, the measurements if, if the perf measurements uh, more. But basically, it might be uh, two times or even more 
uh, power efficient to use the OS background blur than the web technology background blur. And also, uh, if background blur is al already applied by the OS, it does not make any sense for the website to apply background blur uh, on top of it. So I think this explains why it's useful to expose support of OS background blur to uh, um, camera tracks. So next slide. The proposal is to add a background blur constraint. Uh, it, will be, it will be a capability and a setting as well. And it will allow uh, applications to identify whether background blur is supported by, uh, by the OS. And uh, it would also allow the application to identify whether a given track is already blurred or not by the OS. And of course, with apply constraints, you would be able to switch on and off background blur. Um, so the proposal is also to make background blur a Boolean constraint for now. Uh, uh, OSs are more or less like echo cancellation. It's uh, enabled or not. And uh, we could start with this. Um, I think that we, we can evaluate the usefulness for a zero one kind of double constraint. And uh, uh, if we go there, we would need to understand how to define it. What means zero? Probably uh, no background blur. What means one? Probably uh, full background blur. But what is full background blur? So we will need to 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 work on that. So that's why currently um, um, the proposal is to start with a simple Boolean background blur. And um, uh, I'd like to get feedback on that. Uh, if the working group thinks it's uh, it's a good approach, and if the working group thinks that uh, if we switch to double at some point, what would be the cost? And uh, should we, if we want to switch to double, should we switch before shipping uh, this thing uh, and and so on? So, thoughts? Looks good to me. Okay, so just to be clear, we can shift to a double later on, right? I mean, we can think of that because all the frameworks are having the double, but the native platforms are having Boolean right now, but things might change and we need to adapt accordingly. Yeah, it's. Okay. I, I'm I'm not exactly sure about the migration path. One migration mm -hmm. path would be to to add a new constraint, which would be a double, for instance. Maybe there's uh, maybe when we'll implement it uh, at that point, all ASCs will have changed to a double, and there will be a clear definition, so we we can uh, okay. switch to double before then. But uh, yeah, starting with Boolean is probably the the safe seems like the safe approach to me right now. Right. Okay, so uh, I guess uh, it's already a PR, so uh, we can probably uh, work on uh, merging the PR and finalizing the PR uh, for editors. Um, so next slide, the second part of the PR, uh, the same PR, is um, the introduction of, of a new event called configuration change. And um, the reason is that some OSCs uh, may change camera microphone settings outside of user agent control. For instance, uh, you're you're in Safari or you're in an application, and uh, you grab camera access. And at some point, uh, the user might decide to enable through the OS UI a background blur. So initially, the stream was not background blurred by the OS, and after that, it's background blurred by the OS. And some OSs will not allow uh, web applications to to switch it off, but in any case, there's a change of uh, settings. It went from uh, false to true, and web applications might want to be notified of that. And currently, the only way would be to uh, basically call get settings over and over and over. So the proposal here is to add like a configure change event that will tell the web application, hey, you, if you if you're interested in Understanding what's ha what's happened, uh, please uh, call get settings, get capabilities, and uh, look at 
whether these things are good for you. Uh, so it would be a simple event. We would start with a simple event, like no fields, no nothing. And there's a small example there that says, hey, if uh, whenever configuration is changing, we will we will um, toggle back on blur or on off uh, if we if we if we can. Uh, Dom, you're on the queue. Uh, yeah, so that configuration change event would apply to any constraints, to a subset of constraints, to only background blur. What's your model? Um, so, so yeah, I forgot to mention that it would be on the track, uh, the track object, and uh, it would apply to uh, any settings capabilities. Uh, we can. That, that's my understanding. We we could restrict it to only some set some uh, some values, but. Uh, we should. We would need to have a good reason for that, and uh, I feel like it might be useful in the future for other properties as well. Uh, Yaniva. So, um, go ahead. this made me think about a previous slide. Um, so, this is um, apply constraints on each track clone, right? So, how do you? deal with um if this is a global thing in the os only uh, how, how do you uh, i guess you're not supporting exact for example for um so so if in ios if the os is if you enable background blur through the os then the web application cannot do anything so the idea would be for get capabilities of background blur to go from false true to just true and then if you try to do apply constraint by background blur false it would reject. It, it, it would reject, uh, how? Yeah, um, because the um, background blur uh, capabilities would, be, would would only be true. Uh, it would be a change. The OS would say now it's only true and it cannot be forced to, it cannot be disabled. So that's okay. why it's a change in either settings or cap capabilities. But if you don't have exact constraints, you can't get rejection, right? Uh, yeah, right, right. Yeah, then uh, if you if you try to apply it with a non-exact constraint, then it would it would stick to true basically, even if you set it to false as ideal. And I suppose um, if a user agent, for for instance, wanted to implement this in the browser, they could do this per camera, or, or they could do this per track basically, if they wanted yeah. to. That would be okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I, I would guess so, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a that's a good yeah, that's a good thing to 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 discuss. Um, for instance, uh, I know that uh, on iOS if you disable echo cancellation in Safari, you, you would not be able to to only uh, disable it for one track. So there are there are precedents for things that are leaking already if you apply constraints on one track and not the other. So uh, one more thing, a side effect of this is that applications can control, turn this on and off with the plug constraints. Is that something you had in mind or no? Um, so to, to me, if the OS is, uh, is not applying background blur, then it, it would be nice to, to allow the, um, the browser to enable it and disable it, for instance. That's something we, we could do. Uh, at the at the um, at the browser convenience. Thanks. But in in any case, constraints are flexible enough so that browsers can uh, just set the capabilities to true, to false, or to true false. Uh, Florent, you're on the queue. Yes, I was wondering what other uh, settings and capabilities would trigger the configuration change. You mentioned OS level ones. Um, which ones are they? And would it apply also if the same device was opened by multiple pages and one of them was, for example, changing the brightness of the um, exposure uh, mode and different things like that? Yeah, so there's the same thing with um, with Venate, for instance, in macOS. Uh, if uh, two applications are capturing, then they might compete uh, with camera settings. 
And uh, what we try in, in, in the browser world is usually to, uh, to hide this. And uh, we, we can sort of doing, doing that, and we can continue doing that. It will, uh, the configuration change event uh, will be at the discretion of, uh, of the user agent uh, on that. Uh, but if two pages are capturing, I would guess that uh, it, the user agent is in full control there, so it can do whatever it wants. Yes, it would be easy then to broadcast messages to another uh, yeah. page in the same browser capturing. Okay. Yeah, and it's, it's true that there might be like some uh, security or uh, privacy issues, like if you're capturing between two different origins. Uh, so you need to be cautious, and in the PR, we probably need to uh, to add some warnings there. Uh, in, in Safari, I don't think that it would be possible because there's only one page that can capture at any point in time. And so if the track is, for instance, muted, uh, we should probably not fire the configuration change event, even if the configuration has changed. It and could Yoniva, be. Yeah, Yoniva mentioned uh, fuzzing it as well, time fuzzing like for device change. Yes, because it could be used also as a covert communication channel. Yep. So if you if you can add uh, comments on the PR, Florent, and uh, Yoniva, you already did, maybe. So that would be good so that we can make progress uh, in Android. OK, so I think that for PR61, there's uh, uh, consensus to move forward, provided we uh, improve maybe the PR in, in terms of uh, the, the things we discussed and privacy and so on. Is that correct? Rough agreement, at least, yes. OK. Um, so let's go to the next slide then. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Henrik uh, from Google uh, uploaded a PR, which is uh, about adding power efficient pixel format constraints. Um, so it was put good to uh, describe it there before uh, further uh, making progress on the PR. Uh, the, the issue is that some cameras generate motion JPEG video frames especially uh, for some like with eight frame rate combinations. And uh, OS will typically decompress uh, these video frames before feeding, feeding them to the user agent, which usually expect like YUV or like uh, non-compressed uh, video frames uh, formats. And um, if uh, there is a hardware decoding, then uh, the impact of actually uh, capturing in motion JPEG is OK. But if, there's, if motion JPEG decoding is uh, expensive, and for some machine it is, then there's a potential power impact. And uh, apparently, Google team made some measurements and validated that it, that it was an issue. And some applications would like to be able to avoid um, these configurations, so avoid uh, the motion JPEG decoding uh, penalty. So the proposal there is to add a Boolean uh, power efficient pixel format constraints that would be exposed in uh, capabilities and settings. And it would be, uh, you, you could use it uh, in, when calling get user media or apply constraints as well. Thoughts? So this would return true always except for cameras with motion JPEG and no hardware? Um, yeah, with the right, with eight frame rate combinations that, uh, uh, um, that forbid to not, that uh, force you to actually use motion JPEG uh, format, yeah. Yeah, I like it. And probably uh, it's uh, another small fingerprinting issue, meaning that uh, you would be able to detect that some cameras are supporting motion JPEG. But since it's after get user media uh, being granted, I think it's fine.
So uh, I'm trying to understand. So it looks like a fix me constraint. Like when would you want to have a power inefficient <laughs> pixel format? Uh, uh, if you if you require a specific read one and eight, for instance, like uh, I, I don't know when motion JPEG video frame is being used, but let's say it's uh, for super HD uh, resolutions, and you actually want to capture a super HD resolutions because you're uh, capturing one. You just want to capture a single frame, for instance, and nothing more. In that case, maybe you, using Motion JPEG, you, you don't care about it. Uh, for typical video conferences uh, system, I would guess uh, you would like to enable it. The issue is that uh, uh, so the default value would still be to allow power inefficient pixel formats uh, because we're we're not sure about uh, potential um, backward compatibility issues. Um, I guess are we yeah. expecting everyone doing using get user media for WebRTC to update the uh, code to add that constraint and that, that feels icky. Uh, yeah, uh, I would I would be happy to reverse the default so that by default we would uh, not use uh, the power efficient we would not use inefficient pixel formats. Uh, my guess is, is that there's still leeway uh, for the user agent to actually uh, uh, not select uh, motion JPEG if it can. But if it cannot, like if you're setting uh, width 8 to exact constraints, for instance, and there's only motion JPEG, uh, then you would still select it. And, and yeah, that's, uh, that's fine. But I would hope that user agents in general will try to, to uh, favor uh not selecting power efficient pixel formats uh, yeah, but i guess that's a bit what i mean like if you're asking for an exact resolution then as you said probably you don't care about the power you understand that you're asking for something weird and specific if i'm just you know here doing my get user media so that i can send it over web rtc i really don't want to have to tell you to do that efficiently, just do it. Um, yes, so, sure. so the, the, the point is also, let's say you, you ask for a 640, 480, and you actually get get a 1024 to avoid a motion JPEG. Uh, then it's good that you understand uh, through settings and capabilities that uh, the user agent try to avoid uh, avoid it due to motion JPEG. And if, if you really prefer at that point to use 640 or maybe uh, an over uh, an over resolution, then you, you might be able to do it uh, with the knowledge that it was uh, to avoid motion JPEG. And currently, um, web applications do not have that knowledge. And, and yeah, and also I think um, user agents might have different defaults for this. Maybe for desktop, it's not a big deal to use motion JPEG. Maybe on mobile phones. Uh, it would be. Right. Uh, so I don't know that everyone is, I don't know that we know that everyone wants power efficient pixel format always. Because I think uh, it does yeah. put constraints on, no pun intended, uh, what you can get as far as resolutions and stuff. So I think the main advantage here is that you can get a resolution, a high resolution you want, and then you check get settings. Is it also power efficient? Like, oh, no, it's not. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make different compromises. Yeah, yeah. I, I, if if we were to restart from scratch, I would probably uh, try to make uh, this power efficient pixel format uh, on by uh, on by default, but uh, it's uh, it's probably too late. So I think it's fine like this. I mean, I, I guess as long as user agents can already do the right thing, uh, <laughs> then I'm fine with exposing the information. I, I just, like if that makes it so that user agents say, oh, it's not my responsibility, then I think it's really the, the worst possible outcome. Uh, 
yeah. because we know that maybe 0.00001% of developers will know about this and will know how to apply it correctly across desktop and mobile. Because as Yaniva said, maybe as a developer, you would also need to make that distinction. So I. Like uh, the get settings UK, is, I think, is fine. The device selection uh, uh, capabilities. So, um, so for for device selection, I totally agree. Uh, the apply constraints thing is fine as well. Like if you, there's no way you can uh, uh, discover currently, and that's really sad. Uh, like the the different uh, parts of the camera, and that's something I, I think we should we should do. But in any case. Uh, having uh, this uh, constraint for, with it uh, available for apply constraint is good. For device selection, I, I don't think it makes uh, sense at all. But uh, that's why our efficient pixel format will, will not be able to be a required constraint if you uh, call get user media. Like all new constraints cannot be used as required constraints for get user media, and that's uh, that's a good thing. And uh, we would follow this this rule for power efficient pixel format. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think uh, limiting some users may only have motion JPEG cameras, and we we don't want to exclude them from using a website. So yeah, I guess we. I'm hearing this is worth doing. OK, sounds good then. Um, we will mention that in the PR and proceed uh, with uh, finaliz finalizing this PR at the editor's meeting. Hello. Um, thank you. So I would like to uh, talk about sharing and specifically sharing tabs, but actually we can generalize this to sharing anything. Usually when a user uh, gets ready to share a presentation or to explain things to people, they might have several surfaces that they might want to switch between. For example, I might have, you know, something for editing code, uh, MDN, Wikipedia, Stack Overflow, all of them ready, scrolled to just the right place, and I'm just about to start uh, giving the presentation. I share, I show the first thing, everything's great, people can't stop themselves from uploading, and then I need to start sharing the next thing. And here it gets a bit tricky. Next slide, please. Because how do I even go about starting to share something else? If I'm not using Google Meet, I need to go to the uh, tab for the video conference, right? So I need to find that out of potentially many tabs and many uh, windows. Then I need to trigger uh, a call, another call to get display media, right? I get a list of tabs, and I need to find the new tab. And I might actually have to do that a couple of times before I get the right one. And then I try to find my train of thought again. I try to start uh, keep presenting, and then I need to switch surfaces yet again. And it goes on and on. So obviously, not ideal. Next slide, please. So there's an obvious solution, and the solution is that right now Chrome, in the uh, using an extension API, allows you to just go to the tab that you want to share instead and press a little button saying share this tab instead. Obviously, we would like to uh, ship that for absolutely all websites out there, but that's a little bit problematic. Next slide, please. Because until now, this did not exist, many applications are built with the assumption that it does not exist. If they get something, and especially if they establish a connection using capture handle, but they can do it using other means, they might start relying on that, right? They could expose controls. They might rely on the fact that they're self-capturing. All sorts of things uh, could be uh, assumed that are correct initially, but then if the user presses share this tab instead, it would no longer work. Next slide, please. So here we've got one example. So currently, if you're using Google Slides or Google Docs, you could embed the Meet inside, and it kind of assumes that you're capturing the current tab. If you try to capture any other tab, it tells you, hey, what are you doing? And it shows you an error. Um, sure, it could also transmit that other tab remotely, 
but that's a product decision, right? That's not a decision for user agent. If for some reason the application does not think that the user should be able to choose anything else, so be it. And if the user has already chosen the right thing and all sorts of nice things are happening and the user is happy, we don't want to confuse the user by showing him uh, a button which, once pressed, breaks everything down. Next slide, please. Similarly, let's say that we've got two tabs going, and one of them is capturing a slides deck, and we actually uh, remote control that tab, and then maybe we switch to capturing docs, or maybe we started capturing docs, and we can actually scroll in the middle, and that scrolls the capture tab too. The user might think, hey, that's just the general thing that can happen, right? Like if I capture another tab, I can scroll it from this tab. And then they try to share another tab, doesn't work, and they're upset. But, you know, next slide, please. And basically, the underlying issue here is that when you show users big, shiny buttons, some of them end up pressing those buttons. Sometimes that's great, sometimes not so much. And the application, would be the one that gets the blame, right? Because not all users are going to understand the difference between browser and application. The application could not have controlled that. Basically, all of those webby uh, pet peeves that we have with webby applications is because they're kind of limited in what they can do in comparison with native applications, because they don't fully control the, uh, the experience. And when we can give them a bit more of control, we can make them a bit more polished. So. Next slide, please. I suggest that the, uh, the solution here is mind-bogglingly simple. All we need to do is, yes, uh, all we need to do is just expose an extra Boolean. The application can tell us if it's interested in dynamic sources, and then it's up to the uh, browser to decide what dynamic sources it wants, how it exposes it, all of the normal things. But it could even disregard what the application says or not. That's up for discussion. But at least the, the user agent is going to be in a position to make an informed decision. And next slide, please. Discussion. Yuan? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit surprised by this uh, API surface. Um, I, I would need to think a bit more about the use case and so on, because it seems that maybe like for the self capture thing, it's uh, the user agent can already do some heuristics. So uh, that's one thing. But in any case, um, I, I'm not sure that the web application can decide whether it wants uh, the search change supported to be true or false at the time it calls get display media. Maybe it will want uh, the, the actual track. Like, oh, is it a self-capture or is it, is, oh, it's not self-capture and so on, uh, to actually decide whether it, it wants to be able to change source. So maybe there, there should, maybe there's a, I, I wonder whether you, you had discussions for uh, a more flexible API surface or, or not. Or it, it, if this a particular API surface is, I just want to focus on one simple case and not, uh, not extend it to anything. Perfect. Uh, so thank you. Uh, you've mentioned two things uh, going now uh, in the reverse direct uh, order. Uh, if you want to make the application, give the application even more uh, power to make it related, make an even more informed decision, uh, I'm up for it, and we can discuss exactly how to do that. Uh, when you mentioned heuristics, which was the first thing, I would like to push back on that. I think that heuristics are going to serve some applications, but not others. So basically, so long as there are two applications out there that want an opposite heuristic, they're gonna, one of them is going to be unhappy. And I would like to keep everybody happy, and I think that we could. So what would be the default then? That's, uh, that we can discuss. That would be, uh, we could discuss. I would argue that uh, because we don't want to break any or even inconvenience existing applications, we can just uh, default to the existing behavior of Sources are not dynamic, but I'm open to discussion because the important thing, thing I think, is to uh, allow the application to tell us what it wants. So, um, yes, um, I'm a bit concerned about this API because it would let the application limit the user's choices. And 
Uh, I like the feature in Chrome that you can switch. I think dynamic switching is um, a, a good idea, but it also has some raises some questions. Like if the user changes source, is that another opportunity? Uh, will it focus the new source? Will it not focus it? Uh, it's not clear to me how that would work. And also, I tried this in, um, and this might be good for Google Meet to to responsibly set this. But this would be for any web application, and they could turn off this feature on the users, and that doesn't seem as desirable as the having this decision in the user agent. So I tried Google. Um, Google Docs has the integrated Meet feature now in Chrome, and I tried it. And so I'm wondering if this is actually um, related to that, and that the the problem there seems to be to keep the user from picking another source, which in the current Chrome is a problem already. When I start presenting, I actually get the Chrome picker that defaults to this tab. But there's still other options that say other tabs. And if I pick some of those, I get the, you mentioned, uh, why do we click this button? I click this button, and Google, me, uh, Google Docs now tells me, sorry, you can't do that. You have to pick the same tab. So I'm wondering if this is a subcategory. If this is, if the problem this is really solving is, um, we want self-capture here, and we have a specific use case for self-capture. Um, so maybe the user agent should just determine this based on whether it's a self-capture or not, because self-capture seems very different from capturing any source. I can't see what kind of app would break. Um, in the general case of not picking self-capture, for instance, um, uh, uh, capture, you might still have uh, um, you might have actions, for example, or uh, identity, capture handle identity, um, but you could solve that the same way you would solve it for navigation, for example. So there's really no inherent difference to me between capturing a, a, another tab and navigating doc from document A to B in that tab versus um, picking a different tab B that happens to have document B in it. As far as the abstraction mm -hmm. we've exposed to JavaScript, it seems like that should be possible. And we don't need to turn off this source change, at least for uh, capture handle uh, identity and actions, unless it's self-capture. OK. Um, you've said a couple of things, and I, uh, I hope that I'll be able to respond to all. And if I forget one of them, please remind me. Uh, the first thing that you uh, said is that this would allow us to limit user selection. But I think that you should look at it the other way around. Right now, there is no user choice. You cannot actually press Share this tab instead. So this is a Boolean. And if we look at it, as we can look at it as actually introducing new behavior. So we're not limiting the user. We're actually giving him uh, and the new choice responsibly. Um, second is that um, you didn't actually say it exactly at this time, but I think that we've discussed this before. Uh, you were, if I'm not mistaken, concerned that this could be used in order to kind of nudge the user towards certain things. And I would just argue uh, here publicly that this could not happen any more than before, because basically when the user chooses to select something uh, is the moment where you would push him. You've mentioned how uh, Google Docs uses uh, prefer current tab. And yes, that's true, but that's unrelated to this particular thing. That happens before we even show the share this tab instead button. Um, another thing that you said was about focus, and you asked how uh, this would handle. And at least with the Chrome implementation of this UX, you are actually you must be focused on the new tab at the moment where you press this. So it's a non-issue. It could be that you are going to choose a different UX, and then maybe you'll want to standardize a bit more something about what does with focus. And I'm sure that we'll uh, be able to find a good compromise there. Um, and the fourth thing that you said was that it seems to you like this is specific for self-capture. And I will admit that this is very, uh, so self-capture is the easiest example of when this is interesting. And then I would go back to what you said. It's like, OK, why not use a heuristic? I would claim that if you've got two different uh, applications, let's say that Google Docs wants one behavior and uh, Microsoft Office wants another, you wouldn't want different browsers to behave differently. You would uh, you know, um, employ different heuristics. You wouldn't want one application to, you know, to be ill-served just because the other one was there first or is louder. 
or whatever, it makes sense for this to actually cater to the specific application. I cannot come up with a heuristic that we would fit all of them. Otherwise, we would just hard code that behavior. And the last thing that you said, um, I forgot that one. Could you remind me? Um, I'm not sure that. Um... Well, I, I didn't actually suggest that this could be used to coerce the user. So, uh, <laughs> um, I, I think my main comment here is that uh, it'd be useful to see if user agents. Oh, you mentioned um, that this is a way to enable features, but I think it would be better to leave the application out of that decision. And I think it's fine. It doesn't mean that. This seems early to standardize to me because this is still a user agent space, in my opinion, where it's good that uh, browser vendors are experimenting with new features in this area. And I, uh, I would hope that they could do that and um, maybe m make a special case for self capture. Um, it doesn't seem, I don't understand why uh, letting all applications control this feature is necessary. Uh, okay, I will respond to this, but I did actually recall now the fifth thing. The fifth uh, thing that you mentioned was navigation, and you asked why this is not the same. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yes, and by the way, sorry if I put words in your mouth about queries in the user. I thought that you said something to that effect in the editor's meeting, but maybe I misremembered. So um, you're saying it's good that uh, user agents are experimenting with this. And uh, I'm responding to that, that we've got applications, even only inside of Google, we've already got applications that are pulling in different directions. One of them, what wants to have shared this tab instead, and one doesn't. And the heuristic does not actually allow us to, uh, to give them different uh, behavior. But even if it did, what happens if Microsoft comes next and says that the heuristic that we employ is exactly the inverse of what they would like to do? How do we make uh, a fair decision there? So it seems to me that there is enough web, develop uh, web developer interest in this that we need to actually provide this. But on the other hand, we cannot provide this without um, getting some more information from each application. And I think that unless it's actually dangerous to expose or to not expose this, we should actually allow the application to influence this. Um, is it okay if I also respond to navigation before handing the mic back to you? Uh, sure. Okay. So at least for self-capture, navigation is interesting in that it just stops the capture, so it's a non-issue there. And when it comes for navigating a capture tab, you are correct that, okay, so the user can do that and break things, but there are some problems that we cannot solve today. It doesn't mean that we should not try to solve other problems. So. That is my answer. Uh, navigation, it is pretty clear that we're not going to stop the user from navigating a capture tab, but allowing or not allowing a share this tab instead button, that is within our power to affect. Um, quick, quick question as well. Uh, source change supported, um, I would guess it's just a hint, right? And there will be a no hard requirement in, in any case because it's it's all UI in the Chrome. Um, so it, it's just the web application would prefer the user agent to actually not show a, um, a button, but then the user agent is able to do whatever it wants, correct? I am completely open to going one way or the other as uh, the consensus goes. So it can be a hint or it can be a requirement. It is not important for me because uh, basically because uh, in Chrome, we intend to just abide by the hint. But if you would like it to be a hint, so be it. Hi, uh, Yaniver. Well, um, I'm also not sure um, that the effects of source change, regardless of this API, uh, what are the effects of uh, Chrome changing its source on the application today? Um, I mean, constraints are going to update um i guess you don't support label so it's not a big deal but then um i'm wondering if this is the um, all you would need for this use case uh, like are we going to get prs to add events that fire for example um 
not at the moment, but we can discuss that. Right now, uh, I would say, I, um, I, so long as you only change between different tabs, I don't think that constraints need to change, and that is our, is our current implementation. Ideally, one day we would want to support, you know, changing between uh, more dynamically between more things, but that's, you know, for the future. Uh, and then we can tackle the challenges then. But right now, you, you share one tab, you start sharing another. The most that can happen is that resolution changes all of a sudden, but that can also happen if you just resize the, the window that contains the tab. So it's not much of a change there. It could be a configuration change event as well, which we really think that's useful. Right. So uh, I'm not supportive of this, but uh, as in interest of progress, the I'd like to at least bike shed on the default here. Uh, it seems like uh, requiring applications to provide this before you get a source change in one browser is it would be better to flip it and say uh, it sounds like the constraint here is applications that don't want a source change, and the default should be benefits for the user. So maybe like a prevent source change. At least that's me. okay for me. Yes, if you would like that, that's okay for me. But just so I could understand, you're saying you're not supportive. Does it mean that you're not supportive, but you'll say, but you'll not block it, or are you saying you're not supportive? You're gonna block this, but just in case your mind is changed in the future, let's bike shed. So, which interpretation is it? Well, um, I'm, I'm not convinced that the user agent couldn't figure out a heuristic here on its own that would work for both uh, Chrome and other uh, and, you know, and uh, Microsoft, for example. I mean, it seems to me that the, the question here is that source change is harmful on self-capture because it violates the assumptions. Uh, and this is much clearer once we have get viewport media because I assume uh, as currently written, this would uh, display media constraints is also re reused by get viewport media, so I would object to source change on that. We can say that this uh, has no effect on get viewport media if you're concerned about that and about Microsoft versus uh, Google, etc. Uh, well, what happens if we decide, okay, source uh, self capture, you don't get the share this tab instead button, then Loom suddenly comes over and says, like, hey, users often start recording the current tab, then they switch and start recording another. Why have you made that impossible for us? This is exactly what we're looking for. I don't know if Loom is interested in that. I've, I'm not in contact with them, but just you know, any other kind of application. What would you say to them when I then say, hey, Mozilla told us go with big tech and do what they like? You know, that's the uh, uh, I, I think that the hint is, uh, is, is a way for both Chrome and uh, to move forward and for others to uh, try to do heuristics. And uh, a good default, which would be uh, that the, the in Chrome the the icon would be shown, seems like also uh, something we maybe can get consensus on as well. Um, I agree. I think that the hint uh, would be an easy compromise. What do you say, Anivar? Well, so then it would have to be avoid source change, then I guess, or not prevent or something like oh, that. We can do that. And it would be limited to get display media and not get viewport media. That works for, for me too. Which makes me wonder if you, so it's sort of a workaround today um, for the lack of get viewport media is that you pick your own tab in the picker today. So it's almost like it should default to off then. And then maybe you would specify it. With false, I don't know. Yeah, but I that might be a good heuristic, and uh, if we can, if we see that it's a, a good uh, a good default, then uh, we can either standardize it later on, or we can like user agents will still be able to implement it no matter what. I mean, in the interest of progress, I'm okay with any default value that you would like, or no default value too. If you think that it's better if each uh, implementation does its own. Thing. All right, it sounds like we have something we can iterate on. Um, 
just so I'm clear, are you saying yes? Can are we saying it's a hint? We're gonna bike shed on the name. We're gonna bike shed on default value, but um, essentially we're in agreement here. Dom is on the queue. I don't know. If... Yes, please. Um, yeah, I guess the time has uh, gone. I mean, I, I think I'd like to understand better the relationship indeed with self capture. I mean. I, I take your point, Ella, that uh, maybe apps that would need this beyond self-capture, um, but then maybe we can discuss a broader thing once we have these apps knocking at our door. But, but if there is uh, this consensus emerging around a hint, uh, that sounds like a pretty good approach to me. So. Well, I think it would be good in parallel to, to uh, if you could produce a use case that is not uh, self-capture. Um, I have produced that. I know that uh, I acknowledge that it's a little bit less convincing than self-capture, but it is what if right now I capture slides in a different tab and they start remote controlling that, and then I, I find out that they cannot actually remote control other things. And let's say that the entire experience is about, you know, being able to present slides, nothing else, right? Let's say it's a new uh, video conferencing tool that's built only around that. It's not the most convincing example, but it is possible. But, but like the heuristic here could be once you start using capture handle, then you no longer show the button because you think it's going to break. So. Uh, I, well, I'm, I'm not sure. sure. Like using a capture handle, like it's not clear when you use it. You just read something and then you might find it completely useless and ignore it. But the the user agent does not know that you've not found it useful once you've read it. Fair enough. I mean, again, uh, like if the hint gets us where we want, then I think it's probably fine. Uh, but, but yeah, in terms of use cases, like it feels we are adding complexity to a broader surface than the one we really want to address. So that's my only very mild concern, I guess. I mean, so long as it's a hint, it can also be uh, dropped relatively easily in the future if we find that it is problematic. I cannot imagine how it would be problematic, but it is possible. So I would flip it and say that um, it, being able to control next previous slide and that kind of stuff, that's a property of the captured page. So I'm assuming uh, if I navigate from one page with this ability to a second one with the also with the ability, that would work really well now with capture handle, right? So I don't see a difference between tab navigation and switching from one presentation to another. So when it works, <laughs> Sounds like it's great that it, you know, obviously it won't work on pages that don't support it, but I think that's a question of time, really. Well, it's a bit of a question here because let's say that I capture docs and now I can scroll up and down the doc from inside of Meet and suddenly I think like, hey, that's a general ability that's unrelated to like me as a user. I don't really know why it works, right? Uh, and then I share this tab instead to Wikipedia and it stops working. Now, I think there's a bug. Now, it, if I were to capture it from the, the beginning, you're right that I could still think it, it's a bug because it would never have worked. And maybe it worked before or before navigation. Uh, it is mostly a concern for self-capture and you're right there. Uh, I would think the Wikipedia argument is not very convincing because the, the capturing page is uh, responsible to show UI uh explaining what is happening like oh the, there's no more controls because of that and you, you can explain it so um i, I would think that if uh, a website is uh <clears throat> so the, the only case i would see ha it happening is uh if you change the source the web application discovers it and decides to to stop the track and say no please uh please go back to to this this kind of things and they, they can do it uh, no matter no matter the button so yeah, uh, I acknowledge again, this is mostly interesting for self-capture, but I think that it is enough. If we've got even only two applications that engage in self-capture, one of them wants it, the other one doesn't. If we cannot 
have a heuristic that keeps both of them happy, then this hint is going to make them happy. Yeah, I think Univar's argument would be to say that one application would call get display media and the other one would call uh, get report media. But, I would yeah. be. I'm going to be very convinced by this argument once get viewport media is implemented and uh, in all browsers and adopted by web developers because at the moment, and this has been reiterated for the last year and a half while we've been talking about get viewport media, we don't even know of applications that can actually, um, that um, so get viewport media has two requirements. One of them is not even finalized. Mozilla is actually everybody in Mozilla. Some people in Mozilla, other than Univar, have not actually consented to that mechanism being introduced, let alone being uh, the Get Viewport Media gating. So there are a lot of ifs here, and I would be surprised if Get Viewport Media comes in the next in less than a year. Uh, Univar, you could contradict me here. Well, I mean, uh, I would also love to see Chrome implementing this, and uh, Chrome has no such. Uh, blocker on Mozilla, and also I don't believe it's true that uh, I think we are amenable to uh, document policy, at least in this case. So okay. I, I don't fair to say that we are blocking on that. Okay, and do we have? Uh, we've got a lot of web developers that say that they would not be able to adopt this, so we will have to keep Get Display Media for a while. And even if we moved with all possible speed on Get Viewport Media, which of course we should, it would probably still take quite a long time yet. So my main concern is that we keep adding features to get display media uh, for something we know is unsafe. And uh, that seems, in some respects, if I were, uh, I worry that we're getting farther and farther away from implementing get viewport media. I understand. So, I've, I've got the inverse concern. I've got the concern that for a year and a half now, we've been discussing Get Viewport Media, and it was used as a uh, rationale for not doing certain things. And even though, you know, a year and a half later, and it's still not here, and we don't know if it will ever be implemented or will ever be uh, adopted, and we cannot keep on discussing this. I think that whoever wants to champion Get Viewport Media should go or steam ahead. And once they've done that, everybody else are going to get, get on board. But we should use the carrot of here's get viewport media, not the stick of hey, you cannot implement other things because of get view, because of the vision of get viewport media. Well, I don't think there are any big outstanding issues that would prevent any vendor from implementing it. So hopefully we could see progress there, and I, I agree that that would be good. Um, as far as um, it sounds like, if this would be a hint that we could. Uh, uh, deprecate eventually, uh, that might be OK. I would like to see a path here toward, uh, assuming get viewport media happens, that I would hope that uh, browsers would, vendors would try to uh, make this move. And uh, maybe this could be deprecated at, at that time. OK. Is anybody uh, taking minutes? Uh, I am, yes. OK, so it seems like there is consensus on making this a hint. Am I right? Rough agreement, I guess. Uh, well, I, I'm not I'm not super excited about it, but I, I don't see a need to, to block it either. I'm happy. I'm also done. As long as it's a hint, it doesn't put any onus on other vendors to actually implement it. Correct. That is correct. Even not on Chrome itself, who suggested it, we might also not implement it. It's unlikely. We will probably. But yes, nobody has to implement hints. Um, I don't think there's anybody after me in the queue. Bernard, do you have any wrap-up items or? It's only 12 minutes left, so I'm not sure that we can do uh, capture much more in this meeting. Um, so if we're done, I think uh, we probably ought to call it a, a day. That would work for me. Uh, 
I guess that if we've got more time, we can just uh, maybe if Yanivar could suggest what kind of shape he would like. Maybe mm. if everybody else is happy with it, we could just record that we've made a decision. Uh, didn't we skip some issues? Uh, we did, um, but they're kind of complicated, so I doubt we can get through them in 12 minutes. All right. I mean, if people really want to talk about that, yeah. Uh, uh, just just to be clear, like I filed a lot of those, and I am yeah. not going to be able to make the next meeting. Ah, okay. So, uh, so, I mean, so you want to you want to talk about some of those, Byron? Yeah, I mean, very briefly, I, I realized that like hammering out any kind of solution is probably going to take way more time than we have okay. left. Uh, so why don't we just try to introduce it then? Um, yeah. Uh, try to put, uh, you know, I think they're all related, as you said. Yeah, they're all tangled together. And I don't know if you like the slides, but um, where, where do you want to start? Is there one that you think might be? Um, so Please. I think the previous slide that you were just on is, is fine. Um, okay. And I'm not really going to follow the slides one by one because, again, I yeah. think we are short on time. But uh, ultimately, what all this cluster of issues boils down to is um, the simulcast IETF spec basically means that we have to allow a remote description to remove a RID or remove a simulcast encoding at will. Um, there's nothing in that specification that allows us to say, you know what, we're not going to allow uh, a remote endpoint to either reject a simulcast encoding in an answer to our offer or to forbid a remote endpoint from issuing a new offer, a re-offer that removes a previously negotiated simulcast encoding. So, uh, I think that some of the language in Weber TCPC was written with the expectation that these things not be allowed, but there's also parts that seem to allow it, um, although some of that language is aimed at an initial answer, not a, not a re-answer. So, um, Basically, what it boils down to is uh, we've got to decide how we're going to handle handle this uh, discrepancy. Um, and I kind of outlaid or laid out a few different um, things that we need to keep in mind. One is, of course, that we just have to allow the removal of simulcasting codings initiated by a remote description. There's just not really any way around that, I don't think. Um, as far as adding new simulcast encodings due to a remote description in a renegotiation, I think that there's not really any reason to allow that because the spec doesn't force us to allow it. You know, if an, if a reoffer has a new encoding, we're under no obligation to accept it. And so I think that we probably should reject it. Um, and of course, you can't add a new encoding in an answer that wasn't in the offer. That's just that's just a, a syntax error. Um, so uh, I don't think unless there's like some concrete use case for allowing the addition of things to the simulcast envelope after the initial negotiation, I don't think that we should allow it. Um, I don't know if anybody has a concrete use case for that. Does anybody think that somebody has a concrete use case for that? I couldn't think of one. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd say unless somebody comes up with something pretty compelling, uh, I think it makes sense to just disallow uh, grids to be added in renegotiation. Um, the other wrinkle that's a little bit harder um, is SDP negotiation can reorder RIDs at will in a simulcast attribute. 
um, which the, 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 the meaning that the order has in a simulcast attribute is related to transmission priority, um, which we aren't really paying attention to right now in WebRTCPC. We've got an extension spec that allows the transmission priority to be uh, deliberately specified from, uh, from the JavaScript API. And the language in the simulcast spec around uh, how you interpret the order of RIDs in the simulcast attribute is kind of hand wavy and there's a should level, uh, there's some should level language on how to interpret that, but because it's should level, we could probably get away with saying, no, we're not going to do it that way. We're going to explicitly set it, um, which is fine. But if we do get a reoffer with RIDs in a different order than they showed up or were negotiated previously, I think that we kind of have to use the same order in the answer, even if um, that doesn't end up impacting the order in the send encoding, encoding slot, uh, which is something to keep in mind, I guess. Um, and I think I mentioned that I'm trying to figure out which issue that I kind of lay all those out in. It's one of these. Yeah, so it's 2723. Okay. Can, can, uh, I kind of lay out some of this stuff in the comment. Would it be possible to simplify this and just say that we reject if the order is different? Or is there any use case for it as well? Um, so I don't. So what you're proposing here is throwing like an invalid modification error or something. Is, is that what you're proposing? Yeah. We're talking about. Was that a yes? Uh, yes, it was a okay, yes. Okay, so um, that might be acceptable. Um, I doubt that you're going to see any simulcast receiver implementations just kind of fiddling with the order of the RIDs, probably. Um, so maybe it wouldn't cause too much trouble. Uh, but it is syntactically valid SDP, and just barfing on it is probably a base spec violation. Although you could just say, you know what, we're we're not even going to try dealing with this. Um, I think that just specifying that you mirror the order, whatever that order happens to be, and don't mess with send encodings at all is a sensible thing to do and not terribly hard to specify probably. Um, but that's something to uh, keep in mind. Um, so that's really the essence of all of these bugs um, is issues around modifying the simulcast envelope and RID renegotiation. And then I guess there's this other one where we have, uh, this is 2722, where a reoffer can stop the send encodings entirely, which is. Yeah, wrong. that just was a mistake, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's just a, you know, that's a, and I think Yanivar has already sort of proposed some language somewhere. Um, so that's probably a different issue, although it's related. Um, so that's pretty much every, everything I have to say on those. Um, so what is the next step here? Uh, maybe maybe we can, ref in the issues, we can refine the recommendation? Yeah, I, I, uh, think, I think continuing the discussion in, in the, the bugs particularly uh, in bug 2723, uh, okay. if people could 
you know, kind of pile in there and, and read that comment and give your take on what makes sense to do here, uh, we can start hammering out a, a pull request. Yeah. And that's, that's me done. Um, okay. Um, well, thank you. Uh, and I would encourage people, uh, I, I guess, uh, to, to take a look at this. It is a complicated set of issues, but um, I think uh, we've become uh, aware that the simulcast aspects of the spec do have some problems, as we've discussed. So. OK, well, thank you. All right, thanks. OK, so I think we're done for today. Um, as we've said, the next meeting will be on June 7th, um, and we'll be taking agenda requests. So if you'd like some time, uh, let us know. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.